Well, welcome once again, everybody. I'm so grateful to be able to worship Jesus with you. And thank you so much for giving in the offering and concerned with the people's lives that we're reaching. I'm so thankful that each of you have such a heart and such a compassion for people. I mean, we're reaching people in Peru and Haiti and Sri Lanka and India and Turkey and so many other places that God has given us open doors to take the gospel and spread it all around the world. And today I want to take a few moments and really, you know, t just tell you a little story and then I'm going to take you through some scriptures. But when I was a kid, about seventh or eighth grade, I was so in love with football. Like I, I, I called all my friends, I called kids in the neighborhood every day. If we could get only eight, eight guys together, we'd play four on four. If we had 10 guys, we'd play five on five. And I would play almost every day football as a seventh grader, eighth grader, ninth, ninth grader. And the games were such a blast. They were so fun. So often it came down to the last play. Anybody remember some of those days when you were younger, when you were a kid? And um, the style of play and the way that we played in seventh, eighth and ninth grade in the street or in the front yard or in a park somewhere. Man, the, 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 the style of plays and the calls we played were very intricate and very complicated. In fact, here's how intricate and complicated it was. Whoever was the quarterback, they would just tell everybody else, go deep, go deep. That was the play every time. Go deep. And everybody would run down the field and the quarterback would just throw it as far as he could. And whoever could jump the highest or whoever could get the final bounce would catch the ball, whether it was the team that threw it or the team that was that they were playing against. And it was it was a blast. But, you know, every play, it was like that. Just go deep, just go deep until the end of the game. So if our team was down at the end of the game and it was really serious, one of us would say, let's huddle up, let's huddle up, let's huddle up. And that's when we would actually gather together and call a play to make sure that it wasn't the same as all the other plays and that we could score to tie the game or to win the game, to get ahead, huddle up, huddle up. So I thought I would just say to us as a church family, both locally and around the world, I thought I would just uh, pull our life changers tribe together and say, let's huddle up. Let's huddle up. We need to review some of the things that we've been doing as believers and we need to huddle up and we need to call the next play. And so I want to ask you to take the next few moments with me and huddle up with me. Just kind of huddle with your family. If you're at home, huddle up with your husband or your wife, huddle up with your kids, huddle up because we're going to call the play. And I'm really thankful for you guys that you are willing to huddle up with me. And because I, I want to I want to remind you of some of the things that God's been speaking to our church. He's been speaking so many things to me over the last four or five months, so many things to our church. You know, there's a great scripture in Second Peter, chapter three, verse one. And I want to read it to you from the New King James Bible, Second Peter, chapter three, verse one. And it says, Beloved, I now write to you the second epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commands of the Lord of us and the apostles of our Lord and Savior. If you go back to verse one, he says such a precious description that Peter gives to the people he's writing to. He said both of the letters that I've written to you were to stir you up, to stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. I also like how he says it in the in the New Living Translation. It says this is my second letter to you, dear friends. I love that. I'd like to say that to you guys. This is if I was writing this, I would say that to you. This is my second letter to you, dear friends. And in both of them, I tried to stimulate your wholesome thinking and refresh your memory. I want to stir you up 
stimulate your wholesome thinking and refresh your memory. Sometimes we need our memory, our memories refreshed. Sometimes we need to be stirred up in the pure thinking. Sometimes it's easy to forget what God has said. God has given us so many great words over the last several weeks and months, which, by the way, these words, they always apply at any time in life. These are tried and tested words. The things that God spoke to me were not out of. It were not uh, something contradictory to scripture. God never speaks to us something that would contradict the Bible or the context of the Bible. But I've never felt like I was hearing God's voice any clearer than I have felt in these days. Remember the Chinese symbol for crisis in the Chinese alphabet, the symbol for crisis is the same symbol for opportunity. And it really is up to us when a crisis comes, whether we're going to allow that to be something that paralyzes us or something that stimulates us and stirs us up and allows us to have an opportunity to see the opportunity in the negative situation, to see the opportunity, to see the good in whatever's bad is very powerful. It's a very powerful place of peace that you can live when you whenever something happens in this world or something happens in your life, it can create a crisis or for you or it can create an opportunity for you. And I pray that this would be an opportunity for you. And we have been given an opportunity to reimagine our lives. We've been given an opportunity in unprecedented time, never in human history that we know of in recorded history has the whole world shut down like it did back at the end of March and for so many months in some places still in other places. It's, it's different in so many different places. And it's OK because you can have differences without divisions, which is one of the things that I'm going to get to as well. But we've been given an opportunity to reimagine our lives, to clear the slate, to erase the chalkboard and to start over. And boy, that's what I want for you. It's like being able to be given a new beginning, a new chance. I remember when I first got born again, that feeling that I felt it was like, wow, everything is new. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things are passed away and all things have become new. Wow. It was such a rewarding feeling. It was such a new feeling. And I honestly. Even though so much of what happened has been tragic, when people lose their lives, they lose their livelihood, they lose loved ones. That's there's nothing to make light of. That's nothing to make light of. But I got to tell you, even in the midst of that, you know, God said he would prepare a table for us in the presence of our enemies, that even in the midst of all that's going on and all that's gone on. I've never felt closer to Jesus. I've never felt more peace. And I hope that's what's being. Penetrating the screen, penetrating your home, I hope that's the message that's coming through loud and clear, because God's presence is the greatest prosperity that any human being could ever have. It's the presence of God. And we have an opportunity to reimagine our lives, to reimagine our church, to reimagine our culture so we could we can recreate it in the image of God or we can recreate it in the image of fear. Unfortunately, some are going to stay negative. Some people are going to stay negative even into the fall and into the new year. Some are going to follow the conspiracies. Some are going to be focused merely on the politics that are happening in our world today and in America particularly. But I'm focused on following the voice of Jesus, and I want you to trust me and follow along with me the voice of our good shepherd. In John, Chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. And you know what? When he uses that word good, it's the word beautiful. I'm the beautiful shepherd. The beautiful shepherd lays his life down for his sheep. 
And I love what he says in John chapter four, Jesus says. Look at this, John, chapter 10, verse four. Jesus says, my sheep, he says, when when the shepherd puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know they know his voice. He said the shepherd goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. And then he says in verse five, a stranger, they simply will not follow. Boy, we need to learn that lesson from sheep. Don't follow strangers voices just because someone says the Lord's saying this or the Lord's saying that or the Lord's doing this. God puts you in a church. God puts us in a church where we can hear from God from our, for ourselves, from the Bible, but also through the voice of the pastor, through the voice of the shepherd that God puts over that church and over that church family. And the people that God gives birth to through that church family. He said a stranger, they simply will not follow, but they will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. I think he later later says it again in verse 27 of this chapter. He said, my sheep hear my voice, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. For my father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one, Jesus said. That's so refreshing and so comforting, like this whole season of my life has been me returning. To the good shepherd, to really being a sheep again and listening and listening like I've never listened before. And really, it's God who turned up the volume on his voice in my life. It wasn't like I did something to become more sensitive. It's he in his mercy and in his love for me and his love for you. He spoke to me because he cares. He spoke to me because he wants us to to hear these things. And I don't know, it's kind of like in my life right now, it's like they talk about when a baseball player is hitting everything and he says he it just seems like when the pitcher throws the ball, if a guy's in a real good streak, a real good hitting streak, he says that it seems like everything slows down in slow motion. And it's like you completely see the whole situation and then the ball coming at you doesn't look like a little baseball or stone. It looks like a grapefruit or something even bigger. It makes it so easy. When a guy's in his zone, when a guy's in his lane and he sees the everything slows down, that's what happened for me. Everything seemed to slow down in times of crisis. It seems like that's what I'm wired for. Maybe I'm not wired for other things. I'm not wired for I'm not wired for a lot of things. There's there's a ton of stuff that I'm not really wired for, but I am wired for crisis. And I feel like everything is slowed down. And I can see all this going on in the spiritual realm or many things that are going on in the spiritual realm and what God is saying and how God is so relaxed. I see God is so happy, so playful, so confident, just seated on his throne. He has so much peace and it gives me peace and I want to pass that peace on to you. So let's huddle up and let me just remind you of some of the things that our beautiful shepherd has shown us over the last several weeks. I think early on at the end of March or April. I heard this word from the Lord. Let us go to the other side. Let us go to the other side in Mark, Chapter four, verse thirty five. That's exactly what Jesus said to his disciples. He said on that day when evening had come, he said to his disciples, let us go to the other side and they got in the boat. They left the crowd and there were other boats with him and there arose a fierce gale of wind and the waves beat and against the boat so much that the water was filling the boat. But Jesus himself was in the stern asleep on the cushion, asleep on a pillow. 
Jesus likes to be comfortable when he sleeps, sounds like. So you know what? That's quite all right with me. How about you? And they woke him and they said, teacher, don't you care that we're perishing? And he got up and rebuked the wind and he said, hush, peace, peace, be still. And it died down and it became perfectly calm. And he said, where is your faith? Why are you guys afraid? And they were even more afraid and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? I just want you to hear this. God spoke to us early on. and He said, let us go to the other side. And you know what? There's been some storms, haven't there? There's been some crazy things that have happened. Our world is different. Our world has changed. Now we have an opportunity to reimagine how our lives can be. We have the opportunity to reimagine how our church can be. And I'll get to that. We have the opportunity to reimagine how our culture can be. I wonder if we if God maybe said, you know what, now that everything's shut down, come on, let's refigure this. You guys have had it wrong in some areas. Let me fix that. Let me help you here. Let me help you there. You have to stop and think sometimes or you just get used to being in a rut and doing the same thing over and over again, but not getting any different results. That's the definition of insanity, people say. Continuing to do the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. But Jesus isn't like that. He's active, he's energized, he's engaged, he's always speaking, he's always coming up with new ways for you to make it and to succeed and opening new doors that no man can close and creating new opportunities for you. This is an opportunity for us. God, I pray this is thing. You know, we thought at the end of March, this thing's going to go maybe till April 1st. And then we thought maybe it'll go till April 15th. And then we thought maybe it'll go till just May, <laughs> May 1st. And then May f- and then every t- couple of weeks, it just kept going longer. I wonder if we just haven't been getting the message and haven't been listening. I'll bet when we start hearing the voice of God and listening to the good shepherd, the beautiful shepherd, that I think that's when we're going to be able to reimagine, reprioritize our lives. One of the first things that I was talking about with you guys, that we have an opportunity to reprioritize our lives. We have an opportunity to put God first. We have an opportunity to put people first. We have an opportunity to show greater love. We have an opportunity to become a different people, a better people, a more compassionate people, a more loving people, a more powerfully praying people a people that know God's word, a people that know God, a people that want to bring Jesus to everyone they possibly can. He said, let us go to the other side. What a word. What a word. It speaks of such confidence, speaks to me of such assurance that it's going to happen. It's a promise. Boys, Jesus said, we're going over to the other side. You're not going under. You're going over. You're not sinking in the middle. You're getting to the other side. Boy, who can say amen to that? I'm not going under. I'm going over. I'm not going under. I'm going over. Sometimes the next verse says leaving the crowd. Sometimes if you want to make it to the other side, you got to leave some things behind. You got to leave the crowd. You got to take make sure you're taking Jesus with you. (laughs) Yeah, it's the one guy you don't want to leave behind. But he said, he said, leaving the crowd, they took Jesus with them in the just as he was. I love this verse just as he was. Boy, we don't need to take Jesus into our lives as anything less than who he really is. They took him into the boat just as he was. Isn't that powerful that We don't have to take a different Jesus, an inferior Jesus, a less powerful Jesus. No, you know who they took in the boat with them? Jesus, just as he was with all of his beauty and all of his power and all of his love and all of his warmth. You know, Jesus was like the father, right? He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. Being in a boat with Jesus is like being a little kid with the greatest father in the universe, knowing that no matter what happens, everything's going to be all right. Let's go to the other side. 
Maybe some of us need a little more time. Maybe we needed to get this thing straight. With the inequality in our lives, in our country, in our world. Maybe. It was the it was the opportunity of a lifetime. Let's not be in such a hurry. One of the things that God spoke to me also was faith and wisdom. He said, there's two things to navigate through anything, son, faith and wisdom, faith and wisdom. Faith is to believe God. We're not afraid of the virus, but wisdom is to follow common sense. And I'm not when I say common sense, I don't mean just whatever the doctors say or whatever the scientists say, because they weren't always right. They weren't always common sense is is a little easier than getting a degree in medicine and common sense will save you from a whole lot of problems that doctors can't save you from. Common sense is wisdom. It's not so common, is it? It's common sense. It's not so common. But he said faith and wisdom, son. I don't want you to be all faith, but I don't want you to be all wisdom. He said, I want you to have both and have a balance because a false balance is an abomination. The Bible says faith and wisdom, faith and wisdom, faith and wisdom. Second Corinthians five, seven says we walk by faith and not by sight. James one five says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men generously and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without any doubting for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Let not that man expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double minded man unstable in all his ways. Faith and wisdom. If you lack wisdom, ask of God, but ask in faith. And he'll give it to you. Then God spoke to me and some of these he spoke to me earlier than others, but just how I wrote them down today for you for today, I should say. God spoke to me through a verse in Luke, chapter 10, verse 40. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations. Remember that? But the Lord said to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and bothered about so many things. But only one thing is necessary. Verse 41 says, but the Lord said, Martha, Martha, you're worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. And Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. You know, as I was meditating on that verse one day. The Lord spoke to me and he said, son, I want you to start a revival <laughs> like a revival, like a tent or something. Lord, what? He's like, no. I want you to start a revival of closeness with me. I want you to tell my people how to sit at my feet. I want you to tell my people how much love I have for them. I want you to remind them of how easy it is to take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Tell my people to choose the good, to choose the good. Tell my people to look for the good and tell my people to choose the good, because when they choose the good part, it will not be taken away from them. Well, that's what my life has been a theme. And sometimes it's it's not new things that we need to hear. It's some of the things we knew before and we forgot. We need to be remembering and reminded of sitting at the feet of Jesus is not being super spiritual. It simply means to just be in awe of him. To quiet my voice and quiet my mind and quiet my soul and listen. And listen. To God's voice, to the good shepherd, the beautiful shepherd. The Lord spoke to me, start a revival of closeness, invite my people to my feet. It's nowhere better. You know, at his feet, we're still. Ruling and reigning over the devil, ruling and reigning, we're still the head and not the tail. We're above and not beneath. The only feet that we're at is Jesus feet. We're not at the devil's feet. He's under our feet. We're not at sickness's feet. Sickness is under our feet. We're not at poverty and lack and not knowing what to do's feet. Those are under our feet. 
but we're at Jesus feet because we love him so because he first loved us, right? Then the Lord spoke to me the next thing. Strip away the complicated. Revive the simple. The simplicity of the gospel, I guess, is kind of connected to the third one, but this is what I heard. Strip away the complicated and revive the simplicity of the gospel. And that's when I began to talk to you about the beauty of Jesus, that Jesus is the beauty of God, that beauty. God spoke to me and he said, son, beauty is one of my greatest evangelists. Beauty is one of my greatest evangelists, because when you see beauty in nature, you see beauty in the in the sunset, you see beauty on the ocean, you see beauty in people. The only thing you could do is say, surely that had to be created by someone beautiful. Something beautiful cannot come out of an accident. Something beautiful can only come by design. And beauty really is one of God's greatest evangelists. We can win this world if we really show this world how beautiful Jesus is. That's why I spent so many weeks on the beauty of Jesus. Probably I don't know if you got tired of that. Maybe you turned off, turned it off and go, oh, you know, let's go back when the pastor's on a new a new kick because this beauty of Jesus thing is getting old. I don't I don't think it could ever get old. I hope you didn't feel that way, but I sure could talk about this until Jesus comes back. And that's why I want to remind you, this is one of the biggest things for me that God spoke to me, something that I feel like I've never quite. I've always known Jesus is beautiful, but never quite in the way that I've been able to grab a hold of in these last several weeks and months. To know that he's beautiful and to know that he makes all things beautiful and to know that he wants me to experience and enjoy his beauty. and He wants you to experience and enjoy his beauty. Look at my son, God said to me, look at how beautiful he is. How beautiful are his hands that were pierced for my iniquities, how beautiful are his feet that a nail went through and pierced both of them to the cross. How beautiful are his eyes looking with acceptance and approval at you. How beautiful is his heart that would love the unlovable and that would say to the thief next to him. Today you'll be with me in paradise. How beautiful is his voice? How beautiful is his throne? We talked about the last couple of weeks. How beautiful is his throne? Wow. So precious, so beautiful. All of creation bows to the beautiful savior at the beautiful throne. Thank you, Lord, for showing us more and more every day your beauty. You know, and one of the other things that I heard the Lord say. Your story doesn't end here. Remember that? That your life is a story and no matter what chapter you're on, you're in a horror chapter, you're in a (laughs) broken chapter, you're in a broken hearted chapter, you're in a man, my life is just totally screwed up chapter. Your story doesn't end there. You lost something, you lost your job, you lost money, you lost opportunity. Your story doesn't end there. You lost your mind, you lost your heart. You feel like your heart has hardened. Your story doesn't end there. Somebody wrote me the other day and they said, I don't know what to do. My heart's so hard. I said, do nothing. Because you don't have to live by how your heart feels. All you have to do is believe that God loves you and you don't have to try to fix it. God will reach your heart. God will melt your heart. God will soften your heart. Just believe in his love. Well, what if I don't feel anything? Believe in his love. Don't worry about what you feel. Believe in his love. Your life is a story. And it's a beautiful story. And it's a story that's not over. And I love the scriptures. I wrote some of these down. 
I love the scripture in Genesis chapter two, verse four in the Message Bible, where it says this is the story of how it all started. This is the story of what God did. All the creating God had done. This is the story of how it all started of heaven and earth when they were created. And I love what it says about Jesus in Mark, chapter four, verse thirty three and verse thirty four in the Message Bible with many stories like these. He presented his message to them. Fitting the stories to their experience and maturity, he was never without a story when he spoke. When he was alone with his disciples, he went over everything, sorting out. The tangles. Untying the knots, remember. We all have some tangles in our lives, we all have some knots. You're knotted up emotionally, you're knotted up financially, you're knotted up in a relationship. Jesus wants to. Sort out the tangles. And untie the knots in your life. Your life is a story. And your story doesn't end there. But man, we had to go bankrupt. Your story doesn't end there. But I lost my Your story doesn't end there. But what about your story doesn't end there? You know, the Bible is filled with stories of destruction, terror. Devastation and failure, the flood covered the whole earth. And God said, Noah, it's going to be OK. Your story doesn't end there in that ark. Your story doesn't end in that flood. Your story doesn't end at the Red Sea. Children of Israel, your story doesn't end with the Egyptian army enslaving you. No, it may feel really tough. It may feel really difficult, may feel like it's never going to end any other way. But your story doesn't end there. You know, when you live linearly, when you think life is a straight line, we tend to be unhealthy. When everything's supposed to have a be a straight line, you're supposed to go to school, then go to college, then get married, then have a career, then have children, then have grandchildren and then die. Life is not a straight line, is it? Everything becomes a crisis in life when you think life is supposed to be a straight line. It's not. It can't be. It changes, has twists and turns, but he'll sort out the tangles and he'll untie the knots. Your story doesn't end there. It's not about putting out all the fires in your life. But when you view your life as a story, you can sit back. And you can enjoy the journey. And that's what I pray that we would be able to do. It's all about perspective, you see. When you change how you see a thing, it changes how you feel about it without changing the thing. When you change how you see a thing, it changes how you feel about it without changing the thing, but by just changing your perspective. Someone said we're all faced with a series of great opportunities brilliantly disguised as impossible situations. We're all faced with a series of great opportunities brilliantly disguised as impossible situations. Personal perspective is what makes all the difference in the world. You can look at the pandemic and say, wow, the devil sure got the best of us. Or you can look at it and say, wow, God sure is doing something amazing and turning something bad into something good. You see, it's all about perspective. Well, there's so much that I want to share with you. I'm out of time, really. Maybe I could just tell you one more. And then we can finish this next time. I heard the Lord say about three or four weeks ago, stop trying to get back. To the way things were, stop trying to get back to plan A. God told me, he said, you were living in plan B, son. <laughs> my church. God says my church has been living in plan B, but now you're beginning to walk in plan A. 
Acts chapter five, verse 46 said, and they kept on preaching and they met both in the temple daily. And from house to house, it was never supposed to be just the temple. God doesn't want to just be in the church. He wants to be in your home. He wants to be in your life. He wants to be in your business. He wants to be in everything going on in your world, in your heart, in your mind, in your soul, in your body. Every day, it says there, verse 42. Every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Boy, since this pandemic started every day, we've been teaching every day, either praying or teaching or gathering online. If we could reimagine our lives today as we close, if we could reprioritize our lives, if we could reimagine a church that is not judgmental. Maybe the church doors needed to be shut to all the believers because the church doors were already shut to the unbelievers. Maybe. God said, you know what, I, I get it. I'm against the government intrusion and all of that, but this isn't about that. we got to see this is bigger than that. This is so much bigger than that. Yes, there's fights for constitutional rights and all that and voting and all of that. But this is way bigger than that. That's that's living the lower life. There's a higher life that God's called us to. I wonder if the church doors needed to shut on the believers because the church doors were already shut. On the suffering and the unbeliever and the struggling and the sinner and the the lost person and and the person who's struggling with their identity. And the person who's got different politics than you or the person who has different opinions than you. I wonder if we've been too intolerant. I wonder if we've been too self righteous. You know, a Franciscan priest wrote something amazing. And I'll close with this thing that he wrote about the New Testament. He said the New Testament has a clear sense of history working in a way that is both evolutionary and positive. See, for example, Jesus, many parables of the kingdom, which lean heavily on the language of growth and development. His common metaphors for growth are the seeds, the growing of the ear of the corn, the weeds, the tares and the wheat growing together. God is so patient. They said, Master, somebody so weeds and tares. While we were sleeping, you you planted the wheat and somebody else came along and planted weeds. Should we go and pull up all the weeds? And he said, no, let them grow up together. And then at the harvest, we'll be able to tell the difference, because right now they look the same and you'll destroy the wheat while you're destroying the weeds. And God is patient and God wants us to grow together. It's not like the people you're with are going to be the people necessarily for the rest of your life, but He wants us to grow. He wants us to grow. He's patient. It's an evolutionary process. This New Testament Christian life, it's not meant to be lived linearly. It's not meant to be lived by just go from Colossians to Ephesians. Okay, I got to fix this. I got to fix this. Got to do this. Got to do that. It wasn't written like that. His parables were almost always about finding, discovering, being surprised experiencing reversals of expectations, changing roles and status. He changed the status of women in one moment when he talked to one. And they were like, how could you be? They're not equal. And Jesus said, yeah, they are. Oh, yeah, they are. And the children, well, they're not equal. Oh, yeah, they are. Come on, let them come. Don't stop them from coming, Jesus said. None of these notions that Jesus talked about are static. They were always something new and good coming into being. The New Testament was supposed to be something that unfolded life rather than something that gave us just a new set of rules to live by. Why is this so important? Because without it, we become very impatient with ourselves and with others without understanding. It's an evolving thing. The Christian life in the New Testament will become impatient with ourselves and with others. Particularly when we have a setback, we'll really be impatient then. Humans and history both grow slowly. Stop being in a hurry. If there's anything I've learned is to slow down. 
Humans and history both grow slowly. We expect people to show up at our doors fully transformed and holy before they can even be welcomed in. But Jesus' growth language indicates it's appropriate to wait, trusting that repentance, metanoia in the Greek language, which is the change of way of thinking, that it will come with time. And this patience ends up being the very shape of love. What does patience look like? It looks like love. How is it shaped? It's shaped like a heart. That's how much patience God has with you. And that's how much patience we need to start having with ourselves and with others. Not everybody is where you're at, but you know what? You're not where somebody else is at. Don't expect somebody. Oh, if you take all that stuff off of your face and change those tattoos. How could that how could you wear that tattoo of the devil and come into the house of the Lord? Listen to me. Let them come like the doors are closed, maybe because we've kept the doors closed. Maybe it's a metaphor for open the dang doors to the hurting and to the suffering and to the people that want that just want love. They want an answer. They don't want to be told, OK, you got to be this now. And this is what your politics needs to look like. And this is what your clothes need to look like. And this is what your words need to say. And this is how you need to behave. And this is how you need to do that. That's going to put bondage back on people. And Jesus is the liberator. He's not the bondage maker. He's the liberator. Without this love, church becomes the enforcement of laws and requirements pastors instead of being the shepherds of God's lambs and sheep. Become the word, the word police dealers in holy antiques. Without this evolutionary worldview, Christianity does not really understand, much less foster growth or change unless we embrace an an evolutionary worldview. I don't mean evolving from animals, I mean evolving from who we used to be, evolving from being judgmental, evolving from being people that think we have to have it all together. It's something you change day by day, not instantaneously. Let's pray together. Maybe today. Maybe this was the only way you would have ever come to church. I know a lot of people that have written me and said, I, I couldn't come to church when the doors were open, I felt shame or I felt like I didn't have it together. But now online, I I feel like I'm back in the family. Wow. May everybody feel that today and when all the churches open their doors back up, may we open them new again. May we reimagine church again, reimagine a better life, a better church, a better world because of God's great love for us. Come on, if you've never been born again, you want to be saved today. Pray with me, Heavenly Father. Just pray that right after me. Heavenly Father, I invite Jesus Christ into my life. As my Lord and Savior, I believe Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead. From this moment forward, I'm a child of God. Amen. That's all you say. Is it that simple? Yeah. It's that simple. Now, there should be something on your screen that will tell you about a gift that I want to send. You can download it wherever you are in the world. It's absolutely free. And it's the power of a new life. It'll show you the next steps in this journey. And the next one of the next steps is stay connected. And to everybody watching right now, I just want to pray with you, everybody. And can we just say, can I pray with you? Can we just pray this and say this out loud? Say in the name of Jesus. Let us go to the other side. It's everybody say that. Let's go to the other side. We're going to the other side in Jesus name. We're walking in faith and wisdom. Just say that we're walking in faith and wisdom. We walk by faith. We ask God for wisdom and he gives generously. We participate in this revival. Lord, include me in the revival of closeness, the revival of simplicity. Lord, I strip away the complicated and revive the simple. To sit with you 
at the feet of Jesus. Lord, thank you that my story doesn't end there. No matter what chapter it's in, my story is still going. And you're the author and the finisher of my life and my story. And Lord, thank you that Jesus is the beauty of God. I want to be a part, say that I want to be a part of reimagining my life, a better life, reimagining a better church, reimagining a better culture. In Jesus name. Amen. Well, I know I went over time here today, but we had to huddle up and kick a field goal. So I hope you receive everything that we talked about. We'll see you on Wednesday night service, daily bread, so many different ways that we get to join together. Wednesday night moments. How great has that been? I love that. If you need anything, you let us know. Otherwise, we'll see you at our next service. I love you guys.